All right, uh, morning everyone. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, since we are running late, uh, we have about 12 minutes for this. What I'm gonna do is quickly uh, kick off the discussion. Uh, I'm Hamel, I'm lead architect of Ethernet controller at Broadcom. Uh, and in my life, I've seen a half a billion Ethernet ports shipped uh, all the way from one gig to 200 gig, as Gary was talking about. We have been working with OCP NIC 3.0 uh, for a long amount of time from the day one. Uh, long, who is our, uh, our key hardware engineer who worked uh, on the spec as well as the implementation and design, and there are a number of people in the room uh, who worked on OCP NIC 3.0. So uh, what we'll do in this talk is share our experience uh, with the standards as well as the design and implementation that went behind all those OCP NIC 3.0 products. Um, so with that, let me go to the next slide. Uh, we'll cover first the design spec quickly and then long we'll go over, that's where we'll spend bulk of the time on mechanical, thermal, and electrical. We'll end with management and security piece. Let's go. So as most of the people in the room, those who worked on OCP NIC 3.0 or went to some of the uh, overview uh, presentation, as you know, this is the next uh, evolution in the whole OCP NIC design covers more than just the standard NIC, including smart NIC, FPGAs, and other accelerator. It's supposed to uh, cover up to 32 PCIe lanes. We have standard PCIe, uh, standard connectors, primary and secondary. Uh, when we thought about this one from day one, we wanted to cover all the single host, multi-host, multi-root uh, kind of NIC implementation. This enables the whole shared NIC model. And uh, two main things that, that are built into it is we wanted to have one common set of standards-based manageability, uh, which is all based on the standards that uh, you can see in the spec, which gives a common uh, set of capability you can expect. And then there were a lot of security consideration that went into designing this OCP NIC 3.0 spec and the products behind that. So with that, let's go into some of the details on mechanical and electrical. Good morning, everyone. My name's Long, and uh, I'm a board designer uh, at Broadcom. So uh, after designing quite a few of these uh, OCP uh, 3.0 cards that Gaddy shared earlier, um, I'm pretty excited about it, and I uh, feel pretty good about this uh, new OCP 3.0 spec. And I'm going to share you a few things that I, uh, I've learned, uh, maybe a few mistakes I made along the way, uh, it's also because the specs are, we designing these boards as the specs is being written. So sometimes we have to play catch up, sometimes we're behind, sometimes we you know, anticipate the changes and we make the changes to the board. We have to make changes uh, if the spec changed the other way. So um, I'm going to talk about the mechanical first. Um, but before that, I just want to take a step back um, and look at where we have been and where we are today. So for me, I've been doing um, NIC cards for a long time, um, the Ethernet controller cards. And uh, um, if you probably know, um, the server NICs has always been, um, you know, populated with a lot of PCI NIC cards and all kinds of different uh, form factors. And we have, you know, PCI NICs, NDCs, you have MES cards, mezzanine cards, all kinds of different form factors. And then a few years ago, we have NIC 2.0 came out, and uh, it was a very good first step. And from my experience on that one, it was it's a lot of, uh, like you've all mentioned, it's a lot of restriction. There's a lot of, maybe it's because it was new, but the form factor was very tight. It's hard to really uh, pack everything together. Uh, but today we have NIC 3.0, and um, I could say that this is a really good spec, and then I think it's going to be a great spec at the end when we finalize it. Um, I just want to show you a few things that we already have today, even though the spec's not even completed. Uh, we have a variety of form factors that we are actually, um, Gary said, we have available, and uh, you can see them at uh, our booth upstairs. Um, so these are the different cards that we have today, it's just a few of them. Um, from a mechanical point of view, uh, it looks just like a, a PCI NIC card. You have you know, the edge finger of the PCB. Uh, you have the brackets on the front. 
Uh, there's three different kinds of brackets. I'm just showing the pull tabs, one of them. Um, the heatsink, obviously, to cool down the chips. And then you have the I.O. on the cards, the LEDs, if they fit. Um, <laughs> uh, most of us know we, we work together for a long time. We know it's a challenge to fit the LEDs. And there's a mylar in the back. So that's overall, that's, uh, that's uh, mechanical. Since you have controller cards and things like that. Yes? The top side, max size, is, that's the nice thing about NIC 3.0 is only when a single requirement is 11 millimeter. And what size? The bottom size is two, two, two mil, including the mylar. So, um, so just from a, piece, from a form factor point of view, it's very easy. Uh, for me, it's just uh, transitioning from a piece I NIC, it's very, it's, it's just natural. It's, uh, it looks a lot like it. Um, the brackets, it's a really good design, Josh, but uh, I find it a little challenging at first. Now I'm used to it. The, the reason I say that is because uh, there's a lot of parts involved in this bracket. It's not like a PCI nick where you have the screws and the, the metal part and that we're done. Here there's a lot of parts in the brackets, you know, uh, little tiny parts. It, it, it's a whole assembly. And the only thing is it's, it's hard to, maybe for now, because the offshore vendors are not they're not up to speed yet, it's hard to buy these parts to make the brackets. So uh, that's the only hard part. But the good thing is we have three different types of bracket that we would choose from. And uh, one of the key things is, is the vents. Because of the, you know, we have uh, a car could have four ports and it's hard to get to fit in the fit and LEDs in and then you have to have vent holes. And I, there's a reason for that. Uh, I'm gonna mention it later when you get the thermal uh, the heatsink, I think it has a lot more space than 2.0. It's just, uh, and it's the way the airflow and then the, the width of the car is wider. We have a bigger uh, heatsink that we can put on. Uh, and the nice thing is, as I mentioned, the, the top side is only a single uh, height restriction. It's 11 millimeters. This versus 2.0 where you have different regions, area of the car, you have three, four different height restrictions. And it's hard to, it tends to forget sometimes. And then the mylar, it's a very really nice thing in the back, just a single mylar you put in the back and it's uh, protect the backside from, you know, uh, from shorting to uh, the chassis, for example. It's, it's a very really good uh, design. Uh, from the electrical point of view, uh, like I say, it's very s typical PCI NIC or Ethernet controller card. You have the IO on the left, you have controllers, you have the PCI edge fingers, and then and VRAM and some power supplies. Uh, the only thing new, so the signals I list on the, on the right hand side are the, that different than the PCIe spec is the, the slot IDs, the present pins, uh, the function of the present pins, the bifurcation signals and the aux power enable, main power enable and power good. Those are the new things that are added to the 3.0 um, compared to the, to the regular PCI NIC. I think Damien you know, mentioned that on the system side they, uh, also. Uh, electrical form point of view, just like PCI NIC to me, it's, it's, just, uh, uh, it's just the same thing to me, but it's just uh, um, you have to pay attention to these new signals because they, it's kind of tricky at first. If you read the spec, at first time it kind of overwhelms at first. But if you've been involved for a year or so, you get used to it. Um, the other thing is on the, there's an E square prom on the board because the FRU, a fuel replaceable unit. Uh, now we have to add the protection to the FRU. So um, on the regular NIC, we didn't have that requirement. Yes? So the right protection is for the whole device but uh, there was some discussion that uh, some OEMs, they want to have a way to update it on the field. So there's a way of disable that protection uh, for, for, few re for few updates. And then it's, but out of uh, manufacturing, it's the board, it, the fruit is uh, it's protected by default. Yes. Uh, excuse me, your comment, pay attention to BIF and slot 
ID signals as a designer that doesn't really help me in any way? Can you actually tell me what I'm paying attention to and why? Give me some details on that. Yeah, so the, uh, some of the signals on the NIC card need to have uh, be isolated from the system. So you need to add up some isolation buffers. So just to prevent the leakage uh, go to, to and from the system. So that you have to have some uh, isolation buffer in the middle. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the RBT timing signal, there's a um, management interface we call RBT and um, the timing is, we, we actually uh, in discussion right now among the community members that what to do uh, uh, with respect to the signal. What's the maximum uh, delay or length that we can have on the board and things like that. Um, so that's being discussed as we as we speak, um, but I think we're going to get through it. It's, it's we're very close to uh, finalizing this. It's just a matter of working it out. Uh, from we have to look at from a whole system perspective of, and then we have to know how much it is available for the NIC cards, and what does system need to do to be to meet to be able to meet the timing from the from from the BMC to the Ethernet controller. So. Um, I just mentioned the bus isolation. This is the, uh, the buffer that I talked about. Uh, the new thing on this is the shift registers. Uh, these don't exist on the PCI NIC cards. Uh, we have to have these, uh, we have a serial interface to the baseboard. And through these shift registers, we uh, communicate the, uh, the board LED, the board powers, and the board temperature. So everything is, uh, all the status, being communicated through this, uh, this interface. Um, thermal designs, uh, this is picture from the .85 spec. I just want to show the different, uh, it's actually in progress, but that's what the picture we have today in the spec. It shows the different, uh, uh, fr from a server perspective, there's three ranges for the server. And on the vertical column, you have the bore, the bore power. And then on the horizontal, you have the airflow. So uh, ideally, we want to stay within the typical server airflow. Um, but we're training this uh, very nicely, but we're finding the, uh, that it's very hard to, uh, to keep the, to stay within the typical uh, server range for uh, car to our you know, in the 20s watt range. So that's what we find out. So that's why we need, we need more vent holes, you know. Uh, from a thermal perspective, uh, we you really have to do a thermal simulation. So we take the CAD uh, from, uh, from, from, from Josh. This is a 3D CAD of the system. You really have to uh, model it in, uh, in your uh, thermal, software tool, um, you, you really have to simulate it to, to really understand if, if the, the card is going to work or not thermally. Okay, so that's, that's the actual model that we, we did on every single card that we, uh, we designed. So, I just mentioned already, we definitely need to have, if, uh, to add vent holes on the bracket, uh, we need to have the heat sink size um, design properly, and you have to do a thermal simulation. So it's, um, that's, there's no way around this. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Hamel. Yep, um, okay. thanks Long. Um, since we are running late here, I'm gonna quickly uh, summarize some of the, our experience with management and security, two slides and then we'll stop. Uh, standard space manageability is good. Uh, we have a common set of standard now, and then we talked about uh, how that can be used from the BMC side. One of our experiences implementing both RBT and MCT transport is good, even though it's not required by the spec, because it covers a lot of implementation. So that's one thing. Sideband interfaces, even though uh, you think about one interface will be active at a time, but we are seeing more and more use cases where you have to support concurrency. 
what that means is multiple sideband interfaces and communication will be going on at the same time. So your firmware needs to be designed to handle that concurrency. Um, other couple of things I want to mention here, self-shutdown, this feature we put in as optional, but it's very important for you to protect the NIC. So recommendation here is to implement that. And with FRU, we started with the spec, and then we had some of the issue with the spec because some of the small size FRU, they do not support dual, dual byte addressing. So now finally we got to a point where we were able to clarify it, but that's something I want to point out. So these are some of the management. Security, it's really good that in the spec we specified baseline security. So by definition, you need to have your firmware designed in a way that you can support secure loading, secure firmware update, uh, as well as some of the features that are uh, described in there allows you to be compliant with some of the standards that are coming out. Two quick things I want to point out beyond the spec that you want to consider is with security becoming very important, uh, you want to think about encrypting some of the NVM config data because that's where people are storing some of their iSCSI boot password, for example. So that's a recommendation. And also, as firmware is getting complicated and security is coming into picture, you need to have some kind of recovery mechanism. When you have any kind of hardware and firmware failure, you want your NIC to recover out of that and be taken into a state where you can either reprovision it or then restart. So with that, in general, we had very good experience, mostly positive experience with OCP NIC 3 effort. We like to work with the community. We got to a point, which is a very good point, as you can see in our product line. And we will continue to contribute in this area. So uh, let's, with that, call to action is, if you are building your server, take OCP NIC 3 Rodo into your, factor that into your design, bring back feedback, work with the community, uh, and then this is the whole ecosystem, as you can see, it's gonna build over the years. All right. Okay.